people are intimidated by you. People are intimidated by your mission. Why do you think that is? Because black people have been cooning for 50 straight years. Mm -hmm. Ever since Dr. King's assassination, April 4th, 1968, 50 years ago, now 51, this coming April 4th, black leadership has went from agitation to accommodation. Up until 1968, it was all about fighting the system. After 1968, it has been all about joining the system. We went from protest to politics. Up until Dr. King's murder, if we wanted to change or bring something to the black community, we fought, we agitated, we protest, we demanded, we disrupted. After Dr. King's murder, because black leadership became extremely intimidated and afraid of what can happen by being unapologetically African. So as a result, black leadership took a turn for the worse and they said, listen, I'm not into getting killed for black folks. I mean, I love black folks, but I mean, look what they did to Martin. Look what they did to Malcolm. Look what they did to Medgar. Let's go to Africa. Look what they did to Lumumba. Look what they did to Biko. Look what they did to Sabukwe. Look what they did to Amakal Cabral. I don't want none of that. Blowing up cars and chopping people into pieces. They scared our leadership. They scared our leadership. And so the leadership, in turn, to stay relevant, had to lie to the people. They had to say there's a better way to do this. We have the Civil Rights Bill of 64. We have the Voting Rights Act of 68. The government is kind of giving us some things. Let's stop fighting and let's see if we can build a relationship with our oppressor. Name me a people in human history who have ever been able to build a relationship with their oppressor. But Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, the NAACP, the Urban League, the Congressional Black Caucus, they have managed to exist by building a relationship with their oppressor. And central to that relationship is allowing their oppressor to finance their agendas. One of the biggest differences in the black struggle pre-68, post-68, is the financing of the black struggle by the very same people we're supposed to be fighting. That's a contradiction. So black leadership has never been the same and the black community has never been the same. In a new, more sophisticated black bourgeoisie has been created that is unaccountable to the black masses for its behavior. And black leadership is no longer about articulating the demands of the black community it is more about simply getting a seat at the table and speaking to black people's concerns without actually delivering tangible goods, access, services, and programs. When you look at most national black leaders, they are ambulance chasers. They look for the hot issues in the black community to do what? Stay relevant. Why is it important to stay relevant if you're not making a difference? Because staying relevant guarantees me national television time. That guarantees me CNBC. That guarantees me ABC. And why is it important to be on TV? Twofold. Partly because it feeds your ego. And secondly, it signals to the white power structure that I am the head Negro in charge. As such, the white power structure will seek to do what? Financially appease you as a leader so that you never come out publicly against that corporation. This is how Jesse and Al and others, and I'm only using them metaphorically. I have nothing against them personally, but they're the two best examples of this. Build your name amongst the black community. And then you sell yourself to the white corporations, not directly, but by showing them that if you upset me, I can rouse up my community. So if you want me to keep my community dumb, deaf and blind, you better guarantee a steady stream of revenue from your pocket to mine. Black leadership is no longer a calling. It is a business. It is H.N.I.C. Incorporated. You know, there was um, there was something I, I, I heard you say. Um, and today there's a great there's a number of, uh, of performers we're, we're looking now to um, celebrities celebrities now to be our spokesperson of our issues and etc and I heard you say something um, to the effect of, of, about performers mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. and, and and their ability yes. to affect change what do you think about that let me explain that how did mainstream 
non-elected black political figures achieved prominence. They achieved prominence only because the blacks who we elect to city council, the mayorship, state rep, U.S. rep, state senator, U.S. senator, alder person, whatever you think, those who are officially selected to represent the interests of the black community have failed us. So they created a vacuum into which the black preacher can step in and assume that role. Opportunistic black leaders can step in and assume that role. So the only reason why Jesse and Al became popular is because mainstream elected political black leadership has done nothing for the community but exploit it. Now, you bring up the athletes and the entertainers, the black celebrity class. Why are they the spokespersons now? For the exact same reason. Just as opportunistic preachers in community organizations, community leaders stepped in to fill a void left by the politicians. Well, guess what? In the post Barack Obama era, where police genocide is running rampant, national civil rights organizations don't have an answer for police genocide. The National Action Network has no answer for police genocide. The Rainbow Coalition has no answer for police genocide. So do you know what that means? That made Jesse and I irrelevant because voting doesn't stop police from killing kids. So guess what? Young black folks in the post Obama era said we've had enough of Jesse and I because voting isn't the answer to police genocide. So they got pushed to the side. So once again, you have a vacuum in the white power structure. Never wants a leaderless black America. Why doesn't the white power structure want a leaderless black America? Because if you have a black America without leaders, then naturally, organically, they will grow up from the people. We don't want Dr. Umar Johnson becoming the national leader for black people. He's not a Mason. He's not an Elk. He's not a Shriner. He's not a Kappa. He's not a Q. He's not an Alpha. He's not a Sigma. He's not an Iota. He's not a homosexual. He don't belong to no cliques. We can't control that man. White people didn't pay for his college. White people don't own him. White people didn't save him. We have no control over that man. You see? So what we have to do is pick our leaders. Since we don't have any politicians they respect, we have very few national black leaders that they respect because they have basically capitulated to the power of police genocide. There's a vacuum. So guess what white power has done? We're going to make rappers the spokespersons. We're going to make actors the spokespersons. We're going to make comedians the spokespersons. We're not choosing them to speak for us. This is white power. And why do they prefer an entertainer? Because entertainers are rich. They are comfortable. They cannot make white people mad at them or they lose money. Most rap albums are bought by white suburban kids. Yes, we don't buy. We get the bootlegs. Okay? <laughs> Hip hop is a white industry. It's controlled by whites. It is patronized by whites. We go to the concerts, but white people buy the music. Oh yes, go to any suburb and you will hear it thumping out of their uh, father's six hundred thousand dollars Mercedes. You see, I've heard. It. So they prefer the celebrities because the celebrities will never get out of line because they're too comfortable financially and they depend on white people liking them to be successful. Someone who depends on white approval can never be a leader of black folks. Why? Because in order to effectively lead black people, you're going to piss off a whole hell of a lot of whites. And so, Brother Umar, so what can people do? You know, as you said, oh, I, I got to raise this issue. There was something I saw on Facebook. It was a picture of, um, I, I guess it's a black neighborhood. Okay. But it was the buildings were dilapidated and run mm -hmm. down, the graffiti and stuff on the wall. You, it was obviously run down. Mm -hmm. Uh, under under the the, the the white presidents and mm -hmm. white elected officials, mm -hmm. and the and then and then they said it, it, on the top it says something like this neighborhood under white uh, leadership. Mm -hmm. Then they had the same picture, no difference, the same picture, and the same buildings, same dilapidation, same uh, uh, poor conditions, and it says this le this neighborhood under black leadership, black mayor, black president. Nothing has changed, in yes, other words. and it never will. And why? The reason why okay. 
black politicians can never deliver anything to the black community mm -hmm. is because 99% of all black politicians belong to the Democratic Party mm -hmm. or the Republican Party. We have very few independent candidates. If you don't have independent candidates, you don't have independent thinking. If you don't have independent political candidates, you don't have independent thinking. So for me, I will never vote for a black politician again in life if they are not independent. Because if you are a Democrat, that means you are obligated to uphold the Democratic Party's agenda. And the Democratic Party's agenda has never been about saving black folks. If it did, why did Bill Clinton revolutionize mass incarceration and lock up more black men than any Republican candidate you can name? Why? So Democrat, Republican is all white power. And here's the more dangerous aspect of belonging to the Democratic Party. Why did they join the party in the first place? To get funding. I'm going to join the Democratic Party so they can fund my council run, so they can fund my state rep run, so they can fund my state senator run. I'm not voting for no Negro who's not an independent politician. If you're a Democrat, you're useless because you're going to do what they tell you to do because you don't want to fall out with the party because you need their votes and you need their backing. The hand that pays is the hand that rules. But I'm not going to blame the politicians totally for this. The people also have responsibility because guess what? We're not redirecting our spending so we can fund our own candidates. We're not redirecting any of that two million dollar a year Air Jordan money. We're not redirecting any of that four billion dollar a year liquor and booze money. Black women aren't redirecting that 16 million dollar a year perm and weave money. You see? So we are as responsible as the politician because until we say to the politician, I need you to be independent and I'm going to finance you. What's the name of the current mayor of Philadelphia right now? What's his name? Uh, uh, mayor Kenny. Jim, Jim Kenny. Okay, Mayor Kenny. Let's say you want to run against Mayor Kenny. Mm -hmm. He's an incumbent. He got a lot of white power behind him. Mm -hmm. I have to come to you and say, listen, brother, if you want our vote, you're not Democrat, you're not Republican. The only master you got is God in your race. You will not be a slave to the Democratic Party. How much money do you think you need to outseat Mayor Kenny? And then you're going to say, Dr. Umar, when Mayor Kenny ran, he went off $2 million. I'm going to need twice that because he's an incumbent. I need radio promotions. I need TV. I'm going to put an election office in every ward in Philadelphia. I'm going to get a street team. I'm going to pay these kids to go door to door and put my propaganda in everybody's mail slot. On election day, I need to uh, rent 20 cars so we can get the get out and vote push. I'm going to host my own uh, town hall debate with the mayor that's going to ask the questions that nobody else is going to ask him. I need four million to do this. And most money goes to media, right? We going to give you that money. So when you win, you don't owe the Democrats nothing. You don't owe the Republicans nothing. But guess what? You don't owe the white teachers nothing. You don't owe the white police nothing. You don't owe none of the secret societies nothing. And you don't owe none of the sodomy tribes, the secret gay movements in Philadelphia. You don't owe them nothing either. You follow me? We need you to be able to only be concerned with one thing. The best interests of your people and staying alive. That's it. That's how you run an election. Now my question is, show me a neighborhood in America not just Philadelphia, but in America where that is being done. Nowhere. All black politicians are rented out by the Democratic and Republican Party to exploit their own people. We don't have independent politicians because we don't have an independent political finance system to keep our own loyal to our own. So, so tell me what could be done, like the average person listening to this and they're saying, yes. wow, you know, that's that, that, that sounds good, but what can I, little me, what can I do? What would your answer be? The Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, greatest black leader of the 20th century, the only man to organize 15 million Africans without a penny from the white man and without an internet, airplane, or social network, said the greatest weapon used against the Negro is disorganization. 
by yourself, you can do nothing. But together, we can do everything. There's an African proverb, sticks in a bundle are unbreakable. Alone, we just sticks. In a bundle, we are unbreakable. And we need that bundle to be set on fire in the name of African revolution and liberation. What you can do is unite with other Africans. Nobody can do this alone. Dr. Umar can't do it alone. As the late great Kwame Ture Stokely Carmichael said, the leader may lead the revolution, but it is the people that makes the revolution. There is no revolution without the people. So until we get the people, we can't get free. That means what? That the most important revolution in the black community, globally now, because we don't know no borders. That's Pan-Africanism, there's no borders. I don't see no border between Pennsylvania and New Jersey. I don't see no border between Pennsylvania and Maryland. I don't see no border between Pennsylvania and Delaware. I don't see no border between black America and black England, black America, black Africa, black America, black Caribbean. I don't see no borders. One race. Now, before you can have an educational revolution, family revolution, economic revolution, political revolution, you got to have a psychological revolution. What did Dr. Carter G. Woodson say, who was a friend of Mr. Garvey's and a contributor to the Negro world? If you control a man's thinking, if you control a man's thinking, you need not worry about his actions. By virtue of controlling his mind, you know what he will do. And if you need to, if he needs to go to the back door, he need not wait for you to tell him. He will go on his own. And when he gets to the back, if there is no door, he will make one. That's what the inferiority complex has done to black folks. For example, I just learned that Lee Daniels from Philadelphia, right here, creator of Empire, has a new movie coming out called Pimp, starring Kiki Palmer. She's a lesbian pimp. The trailer's on YouTube. He just came out last week and said he wants to put out the first black comic book character who's gay. And it's based off of a boy who became famous on Instagram calling himself Super Bitch. You can look all this up online. It's a boy called Super Bitch. He's a, he dresses up in women's clothing and he goes around fighting against injustice and his name is Super Bitch. Lee Dales wants to turn that into a movie. Why do I have a problem with this? Mm. We ain't got a movie on the Garvey movement yet. We haven't had a movie on the Mau Mau. We haven't had a movie on Kwame Nkrumah's Ghanaian revolution. We haven't had a movie on Queen Mother Nandy of the Maroons who defeated the Europeans, a black woman in the mountains of Jamaica and kept them out. We ain't had a movie, a true movie on the civil rights movement to really show us how we brought America to its knees. So many movies we've not had. Denmark Vesey still needs a movie. Gabriel Prosser still needs a movie. Queen Mother Harriet has an old movie, but she needs a new one. All these great periods in the African history that we can use to motivate and invigorate our people. And instead, he wants to make movies about super bitches and gay lesbian pimps. Psychological revolution. And here's the problem. The longer we wait, the worse the collective consciousness becomes. Brother, believe you me, social network couldn't have come at a worse time for us. Do you feel me? What is social network? It is an international media platform, absolutely free to its subscribers, that allows you to broadcast whatever you want to the whole world, no matter how disrespectful it is, no matter how degenerate it is, no matter how untrue it is, unfiltered. Before social network, you had to get a newspaper to put that story in there. You had to get a magazine to put that story in there. You had to get a, a, a radio station to run that story. There's an editor. That's why they call it. They have editors mm -hmm. to proof what stories is going in here. Mm -hmm. Not with social network. An eight-year-old kid can open up a Twitter and not only put out stories, he can put out selfie videos and, 
You understand? Open up a Facebook page and put lies out and filth. When I go through Facebook, you know what I see? Nothing but the highlighting of the worst acts of self-disrespect in our community. I'm seeing people film fights about children. I'm seeing people film men beating on women. I'm seeing people filming women twerking. You go on Instagram. Instagram is damn near a soft porn platform. Every black woman wants to show her curves. They ain't talking about nothing. They ain't thinking about nothing. But the minute somebody touches her, me too. <laughs> I'm twerking all day long on Instagram. I'm twerking all day long on Instagram. My breast is out. My butt is out. But if you touch me, I'm a me too your ass. Come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. Bill Cosby sitting in a cell for something I don't think he did. Simply because he didn't learn how to stay around, stay away from white women. And the white power structure decided to use the same women Bill Cosby took company with to destroy him. I hope black men took a lesson from the Cosby case. And what is that lesson? You can sleep with all the white women you want. You can sex them. You can marry them. You can give them your babies. But at the end of the day, she is loyal to her own race. Her love of you does not distract her from her obligations to white power. Only black people are distracted by their obligations to black power. The music industry, the the, the, the music, movies, I'm going to just say media, media all of them. Black media. Black media. Disgraceful. Now, what can grassroots people do? Because we have it, though, they, we have it just like uh, those who pervert our culture have, have mm -hmm. access to it. How do you think we could use it now to, to really change uh, what's being portrayed on it? Number one, and I proudly speak on behalf of the founders of the first black newspaper in America, John Brown Russworm. Pan-Africanist before Garvey from Jamaica. He's the first black man in America to get a college degree. He co-founded Freedom's Journal in New York with Samuel Cornish. The first black newspaper was founded by Pan-Africanists to do what? Agitate and educate. Black media got two responsibilities. Inform us, educate, and then help us fight. Agitate. They not doing either. Guess what black media has become? An ambulance chaser for sensationalism, gossip, character assassination, and anything negative that keeps black people's attention. Black media is a disgrace. The best thing that your station can do and other grassroots stations can do, stick to covering real news. I would be very disappointed to find out that Philly Hot Radio... It's spending most of his time talking about the NBA or the NFL or the next Beyonce concert or the latest reality show or Meek Mill's next album. You can touch on it quickly, but that is not your purpose. You are not here to entertain. You are here to educate and vigorate and agitate. Black media has gotten away from its agitation and education requirement, and we are now just sensationalism. Ebony Jet sensationalism. Nearly every black newspaper I read, sensationalism. Shout out to the Nation of Islam's final call. Okay. Shout out to the Nation of Islam's final call. Shout out to the Amsterdam News of New York. Shout out to the Amsterdam News of New York because they still cover real news. They still, and we got some other ones. Scoop does a good job of keeping to, but Scoop is kind of been taken over by the black bourgeoisie. There's a lot of things in Philadelphia going on that they're not dealing with, but it's still better than most. So we need to refocus black media, especially now, brother, because we are in our worst period in our sojourn in America. OK, we've been here for 400 years as of this coming August the 21st, Nat Turner Day, 2019. And I don't think that's a coincidence that the quadricentennial of blacks, 400 years, August 20th, 1619. August the 21st, 2019, will be our first day of our fifth century. That's also Nat Turner Day. That's also Haitian Revolution Day. That's also George Jackson Day. That's also the day I was born. 821, right? Let's look at these four centuries. From 1619 to 1719. That was a century of trauma. We got snatched up by these white folks. These Neanderthals came and took us. Whipping us, beating us, changing our names. We... What the white man did to the black man that first century, we never even heard of it. 
We never even had literature that talked about the dehumanizing experience that he put us through. And let's be clear, slavery was dehumanization. Slavery wasn't about free work. Slavery was about the dehumanization of the African. So that was 1619, 1719, trauma. 1719, 1819, a fight for what? Our humanity. Some of us forget. Before we could fight to be free, we had to fight to prove we were people. We forget it. We had to prove that we were human beings. We're the only people who have ever been enslaved in world history, including the Bible, including the Bible and the Quran. We're the only people ever who were stripped of their humanity during their enslavement. So 1719 to 1819 was the fight for our humanity. 1819 to 1919 was a fight for what? Liberation. Take the chains off. Civil War, Nat Turner, Gabriel Prosser, Denmark Vesey, Haitian Revolution, the birth of Elijah Muhammad, the birth of Marcus Garvey, you see. And then 1919, excuse me, 1819 to, no, I'm right, 1919 to 2019, this hundred here, we got to break it up into two parts. We got to go from 1919 to 1968. Are you following me? And then we got to go from 68 to today. Why did we got to break it up? Because the first half of the current 100 year epic, 1919 to 2019, right? Began with Garvey. 1919 is the height of Garvey in America to where we at today. In the middle, you got Dr. King, right? We began the 1900s with the same strength and focus that we ended the 1800s oh yes we was on a mission civil rights fighting Jim Crow the Garvey movement we was good Dr. King civil rights voting rights we kept it and then all of a sudden the white man the United States government said we got to do something about this they're coming too far too fast demanding too much and they got with the Italian mafia and they orchestrated a chemical drug war against the black community and you know, I was gonna go there that too. we have not recovered from yet. That cocaine that he threw on us destroyed our infrastructure because it turned leaders into fiends. It turned pastors into thieves. It turned mothers into prostitutes. Mm. It wasn't just the dope, but it was what the dope did as a consequence to the community. But the dope wasn't by itself. Let's break down these last 50 years. And by the way, I'm working on a book mm -hmm. called One Step Forward, Three Steps Backward. The History of Black America from Dr. King to Donald Trump. Mm. One Step Forward. Three steps backward. The history of black America from Dr. King to Donald Trump and Barack Obama is getting the whole chapter to his sellout self. Barack Hussein Obama gets a whole chapter to his sellout self. He was not no hero. He was a wolf in sheep's clothing who took everything black people fought for and gave it to the gays, immigrants, white women. Now, post Dr. King. King is murdered in 68, 1970. What was the first weapon of mass destruction? The de-industrialization of the inner city. What happened in Philadelphia, New York, Baltimore, Durham, Atlanta, LA, Houston, Detroit, Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul, what did they do? They came into the city and took the factories out. And then they went into the high schools and took the industrial training programs out. Your grandmother, and grandfather, just like mine, I'm willing to bet, did not need a college degree to live a comfortable life. I'm guaranteed that your great-grandparents didn't need a college degree to live a comfortable life. They were carpenters, they were plumbers, they were brick masons, they were welders, they were barbers, they were bakers, they were beauticians, they worked with their hands. And the white man said, we got to put an end to that. And guess why they put an end to that? Because it was the entrepreneur. The skilled entrepreneur who funded King, who funded Elijah, who funded Garvey, who funded the Panthers. They said, where is the power base? Where are they getting money to do this? Because we're not funding them. 
and the FBI said, all these black men and women who got their own little shops and businesses, they funding the black struggle. So they said, okay, we're going to cut that. Kill the factory jobs. Kill the training programs in the high schools. And tell black people if they want to make anything out of themselves, they have to go to college. And as a result of that, for the past 51 years, we've been sending every black child in Philadelphia and around this country to college. And the only thing they're getting is a life of debt to the banks of America. There's over 2 million black people in this country with college degrees who can't find a job anywhere. College ain't helping us, but every black kid who's going to graduate this June out of Philly, guess where they're going? College, so they can do what? Debt. They, they want to get their share of slave debt. Now, when I went to college, I'm a school psychologist. I was the last class of black college graduates where college still has some relevance. You follow me? Y2K, now, these kids, uh-uh. I'm not sending no black kids to college unless you can answer me three questions. What are they? Number one, and these questions are to the parent, not the child. Number one, did you raise your child with enough self-discipline to finish college if you're not around? Because they'll go to Westchester, Cheney, Lincoln, Millersville. They'll go to Penn State, Drexel, IUP. They'll go to LaSalle. Two years, smoke some weed, get somebody pregnant, play some basketball, and get kicked out on academic probation. Don't send them there if you know that you didn't raise them with the discipline to finish. Number two, what is your child going to major when they get to college? Are they going to major in something relevant? Or are they going to get one of these uh, degrees that I'm not quite clear, clear what it means, right? Your daughter is going to get a bachelor's degree in uh, European art history. What job is she going to get? Your grandson got a PhD in grasshopper reproduction on the moon. What job is he going to get? Your nephew got a, a master's degree from Harvard University, magna cum laude, in ladybug sex during the summer. What job is he going to get? We have too many black kids getting degrees that don't mean nothing from prestigious universities. And because the university is prestigious, we overlook the fact that the degree means nothing. So they took the economics and distracted us with college. 1970s was the decade of economic disintegration in the black community. They created poverty. It existed already, but they put it on a whole new level. 1980s, crack devastated the black community. 1990, Bill Clinton, crime bill. Mandatory three strikes and you're out. Mandatory sentencing for nonviolent drug related offenses. Filled up the jails more than any Republican president you can name. Year 2000, Y2K, new millennium. George Bush is the president. And guess what he gave us? Faith based initiative. Money to black churches so they can shut up, stay out of the struggle, and mind their business. And anyone who dis disagrees with me, Name me a black church in America. And if you want to stick to Philly, stick to Philly. Name me a black church in Philadelphia, the birthplace of the black boule. Because you do know the boule was founded in Philadelphia. This is the heart and soul of a bougie Negro. Name me a black church in Philadelphia that is on the front lines fighting for blacks in miseducation, on the front lines fighting for blacks mass incarceration, on the front lines fighting for blacks police genocide, on the front lines fighting for blacks economic redistribution of the wealth. Name me a church, please, that is doing something of relevance to help black people in America. You can't because George W. Bush found a way for churches to get grants, government grants for after school and summer and this and that. And because they're getting paid, they cannot be found. Brother Umar, there's one thing, uh, uh, there's, there's one pet peeve, I have many pet peeves. Sure. The government is now, and, and I hate drugs. Drugs and alcohol to me, you know, it, it's, it's because it, it does something to the person. Yes, it does. It it eradicates who they are. But now the government is stepping into it. And I'm not just talking about medicinal to those who may have a physical ailment or whatever mm -hmm. or need them. I'm talking about now they're contemplating in some places already legislated 
uh, a proven recreational drug. Mm-hmm. You know, to keep us inebriated. Keep I us. do not support the marijuana recreation movement. Mm-hmm. I'm going to tell you why. Mm-hmm. We know that cigarettes and alcohol kill more people every year mm-hmm. than marijuana and hard drugs. Mm-hmm. More people die from cigarettes and alcohol than marijuana and hard drugs. Mm-hmm. We know that. I don't have a problem with marijuana <laughs> use for medicinal purposes. Mm-hmm. Somebody got cancer, somebody got some other issue, and the marijuana you know, eases the pain, I have no problem. I'm not speaking of medicinal. I'm speaking of recreation. And my objection has nothing to do with health, not physical health. It has to do with mental health and political health. The last thing you need to give an oppressed, lazy-ass people is another distraction to keep their ass oppressed and lazy. So you got black folks, we ain't got no schools, we ain't got no hospitals, we ain't got no banks, we ain't got no supermarkets, we ain't got no ships, we ain't got no distribution, we ain't got no factories, we ain't got no common sense. And on top of all that, you're going to give us the right to smoke weed all day long? We will never get to where we need to be if you give us recreational drugs. It is a political sedative in slavery. The master made us go to church on Sunday. He didn't care about Jesus. But in church, they made you sing. In church, they made you clap. In church, they made you pray. In church, they made you dance. Do you know what the master was doing? He was making sure he exhausted all your revolutionary energy. So by the time you had to go back to the plantation Monday morning, you was happy again. He had to get that revolution out of you. He made you drink. You was made to get drunk during slavery to kill your revolutionary fervor. This recreation marijuana movement is a movement to kill the revolutionary passion of young blacks by hooking a whole generation on dirty marijuana. And the reason I say dirty marijuana, you ain't going to sit here and tell me that the United States government doesn't have a plan to taint the drugs that come into the black community so that it affects black men's reproduction and affects black women's reproduction. And causes cancer and everything else. If you think the food is killing us. If you think the food is killing us. Wait 20 years from now. When you start seeing the aftershocks. Of what the marijuana is going to do to us. This is part of a bigger plan. That it got nothing to do with you being happy and high. And another thing. um, And you wrote a book too. On on this topic. A very extensive uh, book. uh, Concerning the medication of our children oh, and this ah, many parents buy into it. Oh, yeah. Lord have mercy. What could you say about Let me that? break it down. Mm-hmm. Lord have mercy. <laughs> ADD, mm-hmm. Attention Deficit Disorder, mm-hmm. was created out of thin air by the American Psychiatric Association mm-hmm. in 1980. Same year, the CIA dropped off crack. This drug, excuse me, this diagnosis was used almost exclusively on boys. Almost exclusively at schools where they're being taught almost exclusively by white women. But guess what? There's no drug that can make you pay attention. So in 1987, they took ADD and put an H between the two Ds. And it went from attention deficit disorder to attention deficit hyperactivity Disorder. Why did they add the H? They added the H because there's no drug that can make you pay attention. Ritalin can't make you pay attention. Adderall can't make you pay attention. Concerta can't make you pay attention. Metadate can't make you pay attention. No drug can force you to learn about Christopher Columbus, Ellen Keller, or Anne Frank. Okay? So they said, we're going to make everybody hyper. Because the drugs only do one thing. Disrupt natural brain activity to calm down the central nervous system. So today, if your child just don't pay attention, he ain't hyper, he just don't pay attention, he still gets labeled ADHD to justify the medication. A $30 billion industry, all of which companies are publicly traded on Wall Street. Listen, there is no mental health in America. There's no mental health. There's only mental hustling in America. They make up labels because the labels equal money and it equals stock return for their investors. Here's the question I got for white America. If drugs are bad, 
and you're locking up millions of black men for selling and using crack. If it ain't good for adults, I'm assuming it ain't good for children. So why is it that you will lock up a black man 5, 10, 15, 20 years for selling crack? But you will take the same crack that sent his father to prison and you will give it to his son right here in the public schools of Philadelphia and call that crack Ritalin, call that crack Adderall, call that crack Concerta, call that crack Metadate, call that crack Cyclert and give it to the boy whose daddy got locked up for selling it. But you'll give it to his son so he can sit still long enough to be miseducated by lazy ass white teachers who don't give a damn about whether your son learns or not. That's why I titled my book Psycho Academic Holocaust. This is an extermination. And parents are made, being made to buy into or being seduced. They're being seduced. I love that word. There you go. Mm -hmm. They're being seduced. Because when you go to the school about your child, they're not going to tell you that Ritalin kills the brain cells. They're not going to tell you that Metadate will mess with your son psychologically. He might start hallucinating. They're not going to tell you that these drugs mess with your organs, stunt your growth, cause tick disorder, psychosis, uh, depression, suicidal thoughts. They're not going to tell you none of that. Well, we have some medicine for you. It has worked wonders for other boys in our school. And the mother, single, four kids, three kids. Most black kids are raised by the mother. Not because fathers are no good, but because all the fathers are in jail. And the white feminist movement, the white feminist movement has convinced black women that the black man is her problem. So not only is the father not there because the white man disadvantaged him, the white woman tells the black woman that he's a lazy, shiftless Negro and don't have a job because he don't want to work. And they say, instead of worrying about these black men, go get you a nice white man like Senator Kamala Harris wants to do with the White House. Put a white man in front of our black daughters and say, hey, you don't need black men anymore. Come get a white one. Just like the Meghan Markle marriage to Prince Harry. Same thing. Selling black girls white men. And it's all in the favor of what? Destruction of the black family. But that word you said seduced. They're seduced to put their children on these drugs because they're not told the truth. Seduction is the opposite of truth. Seduce or the truth, one or the other. And the moms don't know. But here's what happens. They give in to it because they think it's going to help, right? And it does. He now sits still, but he's also sleeping all day. You follow me? All day. Now he ain't learning. But the teacher don't care because she don't care if he learns. She just needed him to act right. Public school is an extension of the prison system. And just like with any other inmate, what is the number one responsibility of the CO? To monitor behavior. What do they do in public schools in Philadelphia? Their number one concern is what? Behavior. They don't care if your son can learn. They don't care if he's smart. They don't care if he's gifted. We don't give a damn about that. We only want him to control himself. Public school and prison are one in the same. Instruments of control. The only difference is the prison got beds and the public school don't. So hold on. She gave us son this medicine. Now he don't want to eat or he overeating, gaining too much weight, losing too much weight. Now the mother says he ain't taking that no more. Then guess what the school does? Child Protective Services, DHS. I would like to make a report. We have a young man in our school, eight-year-old Randy Jackson. He's been diagnosed ADHD. He's been prescribed Ritalin and Concerta. And we found out today from him, because we don't teach our kids to keep their damn mouth shut. We found out from little Randy that his mother hasn't given him his medicine in over two weeks. This is an anonymous report. Next thing you know, they're knocking at the mother's door, investigating her. And guess what they do? They're going to threaten her. Put him back on them drugs. If you don't put him back on the drugs, we're taking Randy. But guess what? We're not only going to take Randy. We're going to take Rashida. We're going to take Raheem. We're going to take Raquita. We're taking all the kids because that's what they do. They don't just take the one. They find you unfit and they take all your kids out your house. It's called medical neglect. That's the new word. I want everybody to hear this. Medical neglect, failure to give your child psychiatric medications for a diagnosis that you can't even prove exists. Do you know you can't even prove ADHD? Did you know you can't prove conduct disorder? Did you know you can't prove oppositional defiant disorder? Did you know you can't prove mild mental retardation? You can't even prove it. 
It's an idea. Let's not stop. You can't prove an emotional disturbance. And guess what else you can't prove? You can't prove a reading disability. And you can't prove a math disability. And guess what? Most black kids in special ed for reading and math, they don't have reading and math learning disabilities. They got lazy disabilities. They asses is lazy. They don't want to learn. They don't want to apply themselves. And they got a mother and father at home that's just as lazy as they are. That's why I want my own school. It won't be no special ed, won't be no Ritalin, won't be no ADHD, won't be no conduct disorder. So then parents say, well, Dr. Umar, if you're not going to have special ed, if you're not going to have a program for the learning disabled, if you ain't going to get an ADHD boy's medicine, how are you going to deal with this? Real simple. For the ones who can't sit still, we're going to work their ass so much they'll be begging for some downtime. You understand? Because we black men. You understand? We know how. Oh, you don't want to sit still? Come. We're going to clean up the whole neighborhood tonight. Oh, yeah. Oh, you over there? You got a reading disability? Well, I got good news for you. Your ass come to school on Saturdays, too. You got a math disability? Your ass is in school right after church. After white Jesus, you got these white textbook pages. And how much you want to bet after two weeks? After two weeks, I promise you. I won't have a reading disability. I won't have a math disability. I won't have no damn mild retarded kids. There won't be no ADHD, no conduct disorder, and no dope. Because the hustle that our kids run on their mothers, they will not run it at the Frederick Douglass, Marcus Garvey, RBG, International Leadership Academy for Pan-African Excellence. Our motto is, we have been average too long. It's time to be excellent.